Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Learn With Lowell Show. I'm Lowell, a serial entrepreneur, startup advisor, and your host for the show. Every week, we talk to artists, scientists, experts, and leaders from around the world. Today, we're joined with Mike Levin uh, from Tufts University, a biologist. He is up to so many different things that literally, like, uh, organizing for this conversation took me an hour to try and find a flow where we could, like, kind of knit everything together. So it's really, it's really great to have you today, Michael. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's great to be here. So you gave a talk about planaria, and I've seen a bunch of your videos. I read a, a lot of your work, and uh, you talked about how um, epigenic adaptation of planaria. So when you would like put them in a solution and blow up their head, I think it was Bavarium, uh, it would blow up their head, and that over a course of twenty four hours, and then they would adapt without ever being exposed to that in nature normally. And then uh, in some of your talks, you say, I have a theory why that is, but then you don't go into the theory. So I would like to start there and understand what is your theory for how they're able to, you know, their head, their head's exploding. That makes sense. Like that's understood. But the fact that they can adapt to a phenomena that they were never previously exposed, like genetically uh, given the hardware to, to adapt to it. And it's more like a biology software adaptation to that emergent phenomena in their environment. Well, uh, yeah, let's let's take a quick step back and and let me just uh, briefly describe why this, why this is an interesting problem to begin with because because uh, you know uh, it may not be obvious what the what the what the significance of this is. Uh, you got these you got these flatworms and they live in water and they have this property of being able to regenerate. So if you cut them into pieces, each piece regrows whatever is needed. So that 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 already is pretty pretty amazing, but. Um, we discovered uh, we discovered something something really wild, uh, and uh, if you if you expose them to a solution of barium, so barium is this like non-specific blocker of potassium channels. So what that means is that it really makes it hard for the cells to exchange potassium back and forth. And many cells, including especially the neurons in the head of these of these planaria, really count on potassium flux across the cell surface to do their physiological business, you know, to keep to keep alive and so on. So, so you put them in this in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this compound, they they can't pass potassium, and so overnight their heads pretty much explode. And uh, the remarkable thing is that if you leave them in this solution for a couple of weeks, they will then grow new heads, and the new heads are completely barium adapted, no problem. They they don't mind the barium at all. So, so the thing that, that makes this really interesting is that planaria never see barium in the wild. There's no, there are no barium deposits that planaria are evolutionarily have any kind of pressure to know what to do with. So that raises a really interesting question. If you're, if, if you're, you're a cell or a collection of cells and you're faced with a novel stressor that you've never had uh, evolutionary pressure to, uh, to have developed some kind of a response to a program to, uh, how, how do you know what to do? And so what we did was we looked at uh, we looked at uh, which which uh, genes are turned on in normal heads versus heads that are adapted to planaria. You sort of look at what's different, and there's only there's only a couple dozen genes really that are uh, that are different, and so so this becomes an incredibly hard search problem. In other words, you, you're you're a cell. You've been hit with some kind of stressor that you've never seen before. You've got you know maybe maybe twenty thousand different genes or or so that you could potentially turn on and off to try to deal with this. But you've never seen it before. How do you know the correct twelve or th or mm -hmm. however many it is that that are going to solve this problem for you? So so that's the that's you know that's that's kind of the problem. It's a search problem. It's it's a twenty let's say twenty thousand dimensional space, and and you need to navigate to a region of that space where just the right few are adjusted to so that you can better do what you're doing. So uh, the theory that I have. Uh, is is simply this, and it's not it's not much of a it's not much of a theory. It's it's just a, kind of a, a direction in which we're going to plan to start looking. Um, I think that what's happening here is that uh, while while these cells have never seen barium before, they have through their evolutionary history had uh, uh, other problems. For example, epilepsy, epileptic uh, seizures, and those kinds of physiological states have something in common, which is a depolarization of the membrane. If you can't pass potassium, you might be you might have a real depolarization and a hyper hyperactivity. And so, so I see this the ability of cells to solve this problem as a kind of generalization. Basically, what they're doing is they're mm -hmm. generalizing from problems that they do know how to deal with to this entirely new problem that is different, but has some common features. And that, that is a basic example of intelligence, being able to generalize to new problems based on what you've learned about previous problems, right? 
So I, I suspect that, uh, and, and I've done a lot of work and a lot of sort of writing about this idea of basal cognition, this idea that this, all kinds of cells and tissues and molecular networks and, and all sorts of un, unconventional substrates have some degree of intelligence, meaning problem solving and learning and things like that. I think what we're looking at is the ability of tissues to navigate physiological and gene expression spaces in a way that encompasses learning from experience and specifically generalization. So, so taking what you already know and using it as a policy for navigating a new space, uh, the, the, the space towards um, where you want to be in a new, in a new stressor. Mm -hmm. How would, do you think if we could monitor it close enough that you would see that the planar as it's grown, trying to regrow its head, like potentially like trying different methods of doing it and then um then like it's kind of like darwinism like one's failing then it adapt like it's like as a, as a way to help with the search like it's trying a bunch of things or do you think it, it like what you're saying um it's more like they they do like you know a google search for the right stuff that might be general generalizable for this uh response that they're getting from the environment so basically do you think there's some level of like they, they test what potential they have to the environment and it's like oh this isn't working this isn't working this is working it's like oh this one actually lets us survive and, and work within the environment and then they generalize from that point so versus they do like a, a search and they're like pretty accurate and like adapting and figuring out like, hey i can only survive with this these types of conditions if i have this type of adaptation and go in that route do you think there's some level of intelligence that decides more efficiently or do you think there's an element of they try a bunch of things to find the efficient route yeah. Yeah. Great question. So, so we, we are, we are starting experiments to, to test exactly that. So we're going to track them all mm -hmm. along the way. Now, now I can tell you a couple of things. Um, there's definitely not uh, time enough to do a basic Darwinian process. So the simple, Dar the, the very simple Darwinian process would be try random changes if they don't help you, you die. And somebody else who did make a pretty good change gets to live, makes a bunch of offspring, and those offspring make you know make other changes on that base, and so eventually you 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 know eventually the population improves, right? That's the that's the basic evolutionary process. The the exploration is random, and then selection does the, the and reproduction does all the work. So there's definitely not time for that process to take place because mm -hmm. these cells don't turn over very fast. And so in the time that it takes to build these barium adapted heads, there would not have been nearly enough time for a, a blind uh, evolutionary process to, to take place. That does not mean, however, that uh, the existing cells that are learning to adapt to this barium are not using some kind of exploration strategy where they do try different things. So that's entirely possible. We don't know how much of that there is, right? So, so you can imagine the spectrum. The spectrum is it's like a, it's like a typical uh, uh, intelligence spectrum, all the way from I'm blindly poking around and keeping what works and 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 just building on that, all the way to I can simulate the plan the 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 plan that I want, work it backwards, figure out what the right strategy is, and only then do I act. Right. So that's that's you know sort of human level planning or or complex animal level planning. So so in between there are there are all sorts of hybrid strategies where I'm going to try out some stuff. It's not going to be random. Uh, and it's going to be um, guided by some principles of, of learning and generalization, maybe something akin to what neural networks do, maybe. Uh, and but but I'm going to try out a few things, and I'm going to have a guided search. So we don't really know. This is something that um, my colleague Jason Reif and I are uh, going to be. He's he's an expert in uh, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles and navigation and swarm swarm navigation and all that kind of stuff. So we we are going to figure this out. But but I can I can tell you that it's definitely not going to be blind. Uh, blind search we just mm -hmm. don't know we just don't know how 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 directed it's going to be yet how would it maybe too much like a meta question and, and maybe esoteric but how would you design a, a study to granularly determine how, how like to test the hypothesis like what like um I, I was looking at your uh not frog i think it's frog models yeah and you had like these like it looked kind of custom built like these different ways of like watching the frogs as they were maturing up there was like these blackish little boxes and stuff so I'll, i'm always curious like what people build to monitor the thing so they can then make determinants from that so then how would you so basically how would you test your, this hypothesis yeah so so what we're going to do is a combination of um so so typically typically i like i like three things so so i like the first stage which is which is data gathering and observation and so this means that we are going to monitor a whole bunch of worms through this process. We're going to monitor individual worms. We're going to monitor individual cells within individual worms. And we're going to monitor whole groups of animals. 
and we are going to look at what their what the what the level of expression is for these uh, key you know these key genes all through the process. So we're going to be able to, and then and then you can sort of do a visualization right in the space, and you can actually see oh they moved pretty directly to where they need to go, or you no know, they mm -hmm. wandered around now. And by the way, did every animal find the same solution? And did every and if and if they do, did every animal find the same path to the same solution? It may be that they sort of wander around differently and then end up in the right place, or or maybe not. Maybe there are multiple solutions to this. So so phase one is just uh, information gathering and learning about how these different systems, singly or in groups, navigate that gene expression space. That's that's step one. Step two is to build computational models of this that, that basically flesh out the theories of what we think is going on. So, so based on what we get from, from that observation, we can make some models. We can li literally um, uh, make, a, make a, an in silico simulation of a, uh, of a simple navigation agent, and, and here's what it knows, and here's what it measures, and can we reconstruct that same kind of behavior, including all those stochastic components and, and all of that, you know, any random noise and, and all of that. And then uh, once we have a model that uh, correctly recapitulates the behavior, we saw now it's time to test the model. And so that model should make predictions. So it will make predictions like mm. uh, things like, well, let's see, what happens if, if, we, if we break one of those genes and if we say, well, you just can't turn it on, it's, it's broken, we can do that. You know, let's say we do genetically, we can just say that's gone. Will the system find another, another path to it? Uh, to to where it needs to be, right? And so you can start to. I mean, the the way to probe the intelligence of any behavioral agent, you you can't know it from from you know having philosophical feelings about it. You can't know it from observing the, uh, d simply observing the behavior. You have to do perturbation experiments. So you have to put roadblocks in its way of various kinds, and then you can ask questions like, okay, well, what does your model predict it will do? And so that's that's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, be able to uh, to to send it signals of various types along the way, and uh, and and to break various things, and to give it new options, and see what it can do. To, for example, for, and another thing that you might imagine doing is uh, you might imagine uh, giving it the option of putting in a new transgene. That's not easy in planaria, actually, but in other animals, you could you could uh, give it a, give it the option of a new gene that might actually solve the problem very easily, right? and see if the cells are smart enough to turn it on. What information do they need in order to be able to self-medicate as it were for a novel stressor? Like that's that's an interesting project that, that we're working on. If it works, if the test, you know, I don't know if it, like the, the stars align and it works on the first try, you get all the data perfectly, you can, you can find a model quickly and um, you, you can test it out. What would be the result of it acting the way you expect it to act? Like what would be, you'd be able to like turtle up your way to larger systems or other forms of intelligence because you're working on several different projects. So what would be the, the, the effects of it working exactly how you think it works? You mean, uh, the broader, broader, uh, broader implications for, for, yeah. The field? yeah. Well, yeah. uh, yeah. So, so, so actually there are two, there are two interesting implications to this one. One is for the basis for the basic uh, field of basal cognition. So this idea of mm -hmm. how does, uh, generalization, problem solving, navigational competencies, how do these things work in different problem spaces? So obviously the three-dimensional space of behavior that everybody studies, and then these weird uh, spaces like transcriptional space, meaning gene expression space or anatomical space. So just, just a much better understanding of, of intelligence and intelligence and unconventional media. And then the scaling of intelligence, for example, do the cells help each other make decisions? Right, and that has all sorts of implications for basic evolution, for swarm robotics, mm -hmm. for how we understand ourselves, because we are basically a collective intelligence, right? We are, we are a bag of neurons and some others, some other stuff, and so so we need to understand how our emergent intelligence comes about from the small competencies of individual cells. So it would have all kinds of implications there. It would have implications for for biomedicine, because if we can uh, if we can understand how uh, how these cells make decisions about what they're going to turn on and off. That really gives us much better, a much better handle on potential therapeutics for all kinds of uh, novel, novel scenarios that are currently very difficult to deal with. Um, so that's, that's kind of one, one big bag of stuff. There, there, there's another, there's another component here, which is kind of interesting. And I don't think, I don't think I've talked about this anywhere before. So this, this, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do my best here, but this, this is my first time kind of ver verbalizing this, uh, this idea. Um, there's something uh, there's something interesting here for understanding evolution as a whole because uh, 
let's think about uh, the traditional and and this isn't this isn't really how it happened but the, but the the traditional way oftentimes that students learn this about evolution is that there's this old quote unquote lamarckian view which which is that let's just as an example if you're a giraffe and you spend a lot of time trying to reach for uh, certain uh, you know a tall uh, um, kind of uh, treated leaves in, in your in your environment then that effort of, of uh, that the effort which has some specificity for the problem you're trying to solve that effort is going to ensure that your offspring have a higher chance of having changes that are aligned with that effort so your offspring are going to have longer necks that's the that's the quote unquote Lamarckian view that 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 the changes that are going to be made are in some way targeted to whatever problems you were trying to solve this is contrasted with uh, the modern, uh, what's called Darwinian view, which is which is this: no, the changes are entirely random, and all that happens is that selection picks out of the of the huge variety of of offspring that you're going to make with different uh, different mutations. It's going to pick out the correct ones, and so there's this sort of um, uh, hill climbing search, and, and and the evolutionary process eventually finds something that 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 solves the problem well enough. That's the th those are those are roughly um, the the two the two views that people think about now. Now the reason that the the, the Lamarckian way is so difficult is not what people are often told, which is that it what what students are often told is is that uh, there's this Weismann's barrier, which just basically means that your egg and sperm are set aside separately. So any mutations happen to your body or whatever stretching you might do or whatever other things your body might do, all of that disappears at the end of your lifespan. Your children don't inherit any of that. They just inherit from the egg and sperm. So those are the only targets, right? So that's typically what, 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 why, 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 how it's explained. That's, that's not actually the, pro the, the problem. That's not the difficult problem. There are many ways actually for changes in the body to be imprinted on egg and sperm. And now the uh, the fields of um, transgenerational inheritance and the work of people like Oded Rahavi and so on are, uh, are are showing how how the how that 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 can work. That that's not the hard part. The hard part is this: uh, the problem is that there is no one-to-one -one mapping between genes and most body features. There's no gene for neck length, for example, in giraffes. So if you do stretch your neck or whatever you're doing, the question is: well, how does the body know which cell, which genes to alter? Right to to get that effect, you, you have no idea which which genes because because the genes don't code for body characters. What the genes code for are proteins that are basically little tiny um, hardware that every cell gets to have, and it's the physiological interactions of that hardware that eventually give you a complex outcome like a body shape, a full function, and so on. So it becomes it becomes very very hard to see how it is that uh, any kind of any kind of uh, uh, challenges to the body know which which genes are going to be uh, going to be altered. That problem, by the way, is not just a problem for, for this kind of uh, hard Lamarckian inheritance. It's also, also a problem for gene therapies. So if you're doing CRISPR or any kind of gene therapy, you've got to figure out what genes do I need to change to make an improvement. And for some single gene diseases, the, that there's going to be some low-hanging fruit where, where that's pretty easy, you know, and metabolic enzymes and things like that, where it really is one-to-one, -one, one gene to one, one character. But typically speaking, that's not true. And it's this horrible, uh, what's called an inverse problem of figuring out what genes would I change to make a specific uh, outcome, you know, re re repair somebody's birth defect or, or grow back a limb or something like that. So that's really hard. So it now occurs to me that this, this barium experiment is actually really important because what it suggests is that cells actually have a mechanism to work the central dogma backwards, to figure out uh, what genes are relevant to a particular physiological stressor. We don't know how they do it yet, but it's pretty clear that they have a way of doing that because once you've figured out which genes to up and down regulate, after that, uh, mutating those genes is kind of trivial. It's a, the hard problem is the computational problem of knowing what to mutate. So, so it occurs to me that this, 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 this uh, competency of cells to narrow in on a small set of genetic targets that are appropriate to repairing a new um, uh, stressor that they have never seen before is potentially of, of, of huge utility in evolution because it focuses it, it, it focuses your, your search. So I'm certainly not saying yet that that's how evolution works. We haven't, uh, we haven't mm -hmm. shown that, but it occurs to me that for the first time, it offers an actual um, mechanism by which something like that might happen. So that's, you know, that's what I'm, what I'm interested in. It, it sounds like it might, there's been some theories on how the mitochondria got into the cell. And so I wonder if 
if that type of um, structure might explain how, you know, like the, the mitochondria for uh, people who don't know, like it has like its own membrane. Man, many people think like we had a cell and then we kind of like lassoed it and like brought it into us so that we could all work together. Well, the multicellular organisms could work together, not and then it works out to be us. But um, I've always wondered like how, how they know to do that. What would, what would they do to do that? So I can imagine like a really long time ago, there being a cell that's in an environment where it's like, well, I'm getting tired a lot or like I'm not happy with the way I'm generating energy. And they see like a mitochondria in their environment that has the capacity to do what they need to be a, a, a battery pack, like they're the missing thing that they want. And they deliberately kind of work to bring the mitochondria in versus like randomly being exposed to mitochondria and then somehow slipping it across this membrane into its body. I, I don't know the many different ways of, of theorizing it, but I feel like the process you're going down might suggest that it wasn't random brought into the cell and it, like, all oh, this works, so we're going to keep doing it. It might have been the cell, the existing cell body seeing the being exposed to the mitochondria and its benefits purposely to some extent, bringing it into itself to then harness that for everyone's benefit to keep moving up the multicellular ladder. Um, I don't know if there's like other theories out there that like, you know, kind of poke holes in what I just said, but it feels like that might explain that thing, which I've been wondering for some time, like how do, how do, how do, how do, how do, how do uh, single cell organisms band together and then start building the blocks that become organs that become people and, and all these other things. Cause that's, that's one of the interesting things about your work is you talk about how like everything's kind of competing with each other and working to each, with each other as you go from the cell all the way up and all the way back down. And like we were saying now, it, you know, it used to be, you know, DNA works its way up and then everyone else is like kind of a slave to DNA, but that now it, it looks like the body can then work. The anatomy can kind of work its way down to, to regulate safe itself back up. Which is very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to see where that goes in, in science and in general. But uh, does that does that ring true to you? Am I like am I like seeing something there, or is it? Or, or do you know more about like how mitochondria was uh, 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 domesticated? That would make better sense. Well, um, no, no, no. So I'm not an expert on how mitochondria got got domesticated in any way. But the, but I can give you a couple of thoughts on it. I mean, basically. The, the null hypothesis, the background assumption is going to be always that it's random. That's the simplest, mm -hmm. the simplest uh, model that it's just random and the things that, you know, when it, when it works, it works. Um, now, now in order, in order to, in order to uh, s support the kind of hypothesis you've made, which is that cells are actually able to take up something that that uh, was going to be useful to them and that, and that that wasn't a completely random process that was biased in some way that the cells in some way could predict that this was going to be a good idea. Uh, that's that's that, that that would be a hugely controversial sort of view. I think most people mm -hmm. would, would would think that's that's impossible. I, I'm not sure it's impossible. I, I know that uh, there are there are pathways by, by which cells, uh, test out the fitness of nearby neighbors. So there are pathways in development. There are there are there are ways for cells to sort of probe their neighbors and gain some degree of confidence that uh, that their neighbors are are high quality cells. And and if not, they get killed off. So uh, it's it's not impossible to me that if cells have the capacity to do things like this. That is some sort of amoeba that came across a bacterium that was uh, a mitochondrion, could could uh, could that uh, early organism have sensed uh, you know the 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 ATP levels or the ions or something coming off of that mitochondria and make an educated guess that better than 50 50 this would be this might be something that would be cool to to incorporate. I, you know, I, I think that's a, I think that's a very strong claim. I think that would require a lot of evidence. I don't think we have that evidence, but I don't think it's impossible. I think that um, you, so people could do experiments uh, with with cells, and I think it would actually be a pretty good idea to it's I, to, to me this is this is all a branch of that that self medication idea that I that I pulled out earlier, where where what capacity do cells have to choose things in their environment that are going to help them? You know, there are many animals that do this. There are many, uh, there's a, there's a, a human syndrome where people will eat wallpaper and things like this when they have weird micronutrient deficiencies that are present in the, in the, in the glue of the wallpaper and things like this. And, you know, dogs will eat uh, specific things when they're um, uh, all, all kinds of animals self-medicate. And uh, some of that may be hardwired by evolution and some of it, Maybe a more generic ability for uh, living systems to do a little bit of 
look ahead based on uh, the measurements that they take, you know, chemical signals that they get as far as how likely is this thing going to help me? I'm, I'm just, I, I, I think it's very uh, uh, unlikely that it's completely random. I think living things are probably quite good at doing that computation, but it's unclear what they're able to do or what the limitations of that are. So I think, I think those are the kinds of experiments that can be done. And so maybe, maybe cells can uh, sort of gauge the relative worth of incorporating material like organelles and things like this. Yeah. Hmm. There's also, you know, there are also um, uh, examples of uh, what is it? Uh, is it nematostella? There's some, there's some sort of, there's some sort of critter that steals, um, uh, steals uh, poison barbs from some other animal uh, and uses them right in internally to, 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 for its own, for its own purposes. So this idea of, of, of incorporating material uh but but whether it's whether it's organic or inorganic material and having having some way of of estimating uh whether this is a good idea or not i think is probably pretty basic in biology so maybe Mm -hmm. yeah the it kind of goes to the related question when we talk about intelligence because there's a there's a couple of things just we're 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 still talking on plenary We're, we're 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 like not even uh even larger complex organisms but this is like some pretty really cool stuff the there was one thing you saw where if the head is damaged on the planaria and it regrows like can retain memories and mm-hmm. i thought that was so such a wild idea because the you know everyone would think like you damage a brain you damage the memories like that's just kind of how it works how is it that the memories like where are memories stored then like are they stored <laughs> like somewhere in the cells like is there like a, a backup somewhere in the body somewhere uh, or is it like kind of like a Descartes thing where like like the mind is like a, a dualism where like a, there's like a little spirit that's uh, not attached to the body? Like how do you, how does that, how does the structure that maintains memory, if destroyed and regrows, able to maintain memory? That's such a wild idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a few things. Um, let's, let's, uh, we're going to, uh, everything I say is predicated on uh, this idea that we're not going to go down the dualist route, mostly because I don't know how to do experiments with that, and that doesn't uh, mm-hmm. really help us, uh, you know, do the next uh, bunch of research. So, so we'll we'll set that aside for the moment. Um, now, now this this idea that memories survive regeneration, I certainly didn't come up with it. This was this was the, based on very old experiments in the '60s by a guy named James McConnell, and he did tons of experiments on this. He caught a lot of a lot of flack over it. Uh, but he was, but he was right uh, about many of his many of his claims. And uh, and after that, there was some uh, some early Russian work by uh, somebody called Shainman, and um, uh, they did they they looked at so 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 McConnell worked in planaria and and trained them and cut their heads off. Uh, Shainman worked in um, larval uh, insects, so so caterpillars and uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, beetles and and things like this. And there was and there was a bunch of work after that too in the, in in the, in in rats and in human um, uh, yeah and butterflies and things like that. So um, the question is where 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 is the memory stored? So. So actually, this is this is still fairly controversial, even in neuroscience, even in the brain. Like, how is me- how are memories stored in the brain? Because the interesting thing is that you know, let's say let's say you've got a a human being who's uh, you know eighty years old, they will have memories from their childhood. And so, the qu- one question you might ask is, okay, what memory medium do we have in the brain? What structure do we have in the brain that survives unchanged for eighty years? What do we have? That's that's right. Because the way the way we would normally do this, if in in engineering, when you record material as part of a memory, you want something like a uh, like a like an optical disc, or you want something like some sort of magnetic media, where you need a you need a material that's going to hold its state for the length of the memory. And so, so we can ask ourselves, okay, what in uh, what in the brain is, holds these these states for eighty years that could record the information? As far as we can tell, nothing. As far as we can tell, everything in the brain turns over and is is highly plastic. So this so 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 memory is unlikely to um to uh to be something that has to stick around unchanged. The the current ideas are that it's basically uh, a set of patterns that have to be uh sort of kept up and reconstructed and and all of that. So one other ingredient in this uh, in this uh, idea that you need is the is this idea that. You know, people often think of neurons as very special, and they and they certainly do some interesting things. But uh, they didn't pick up these tricks from scratch. They evolved from other cells that have all the same machinery. So all the cytoskeleton stuff that you need to make uh, specific structure, neural structures, all the um, 
uh, ion channels, the electrical synapses, the, the vesicle machinery, every cell has that stuff. And so it's not crazy to think that uh, some aspects of memory may be stored in multiple uh, multiple tissues, not just in the brain. Um, uh, Doug Blackiston, um, who's, who's now a staff scientist in my lab, did some, some beautiful work showing that if you train caterpillars, then the, uh, the moth or butterfly that you get will still remember the original information, even though the brain is basically dissolved during metamorphosis and reassembled right into from, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. So um, there, are, there are lots of examples like this. And uh, if there have been many theories. One, one theory was put out by a guy named Paul Peach. And he has this amazing book called Shuffle Brain um, in the late 80s, where hmm. he moved around pieces of a, uh, of a, of a salamander's brain and looked at, he was, he was looking for memory. And, and basically he came up with a holographic theory that basically treats, uh, treats uh, the brain as a holographic medium. So that's one, one possibility. Uh, somebody like David Glantzman uh, in California studies memory encoded in RNA. So he's able to use uh, basically transplant RNA from a trained animal to a, to a naive animal and show that some memories uh, move over that way. So, uh, you know, we have to ask ourselves, uh, is, is uh, our, our brain mechanisms really the storage of memory or are they more an interpretation medium for some other subcellular events that can be copied from one to another? And just in, in general, I, I want to say kind of two, two weird, uh, weird ways of thinking about it. W one is that this ability for, you know, so, so in the case of the planarian, you train them, you cut off the head, you got this tail, and then as the new brain develops, that information has to be imprinted onto the new brain yeah, in order for the animal to have behavior. So, so what you're really looking at is not just storage. You're looking at the movement of information across tissue from one tissue to another, right, from the tail onto this new brain. So uh, all of this kind of stuff is more generally a, 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 a fragment of the whole field of asking about how information moves through tissues. What kinds of things are cells able to tell each other and tissues able to tell each other? What kinds of information? And there are not only examples of, of it moving across from one body to another, which is that people do, you know, people try for memory transplants in terms of moving pieces of the brain. And you can also do, we do all kinds of, uh, in our lab, we do all kinds of movements of, of, uh, pieces of tissue with different morphogenetic um, signaling from one animal to the other and see how the system is able to, to interact with that new information. But there's also a very deep and profound thing here for all of us, which is, which is on, the, on, the, on the nature of, of, of us as persistent, um, persistent uh, individuals. Uh, think about this at any particular moment. So, so, you, so you feel like a, presumably uh, like, like me, you feel like a continuous being with with a history right with memories with a past you know you feel like you feel like this extended mental being but the reality is that at any given moment your mind doesn't have access to the past you don't have any way of accessing the past what you have access to are the traces called engrams the memory traces that the past has left in your brain or body and so pretty much to maintain a consistent self what you constantly have to do is you constantly have to rebuild your, your, your cognition based on uh, the memory traces, the clues that, that you have. It's a little bit like, you know, there's, there's people who, uh, who have had uh, some kind of brain damage and they can't form new memories. So oftentimes, some, some, one thing that, that people will do is they'll leave themselves a note. So you've got this, you've got this, uh, you've got this notebook and you wake up in the morning and you're a little confused. You pick up this notebook and the first thing it says is, You've got anterior grade amnesia, but but and and here's what happened. Here's what's going on, and it sort of catches you up, right? And the last thing on the note is, and by the way, at the end of the day, don't forget to write the next note. And so you do that, and the next day you're back to zero, but you've got a better note. Uh, that process is what all of us do, except our notebook is internal, and mm -hmm. certain patients have to externalize that process when that into an, into a physical notebook when when that that you know when that breaks down inside but that's what all of us are doing all the time so you're constantly having to rebuild and reconstruct your past and you know this also this also ties into the old uh, i think it was it was uh, Hume or Boltzmann uh, who who had this idea and said that you know if if the universe was made the entire universe came into being seven seconds ago, including your body, your brain, your memory traces, 
you would never know. You would interpret those as having a lengthy history of your childhood and, you know, and, and all of this stuff. Right. So, so that's, I mean, that's, that's very true. Right. So, so, so this movement of information and having to reconstruct yourself from information in the body is what living systems do. I think it's very fundamental. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've seen it in Planaria when you, I think there was a, there was one uh, experiment you did where you, <laughs> there's a technical term for this, but I call it jarbled, like you jarbled a, a frog's brain and then it like put itself back together, but it kept the, I think the, the scarring for when you messed with the frog's brain. What, did the frog, like other than, uh, other than planaria, have we seen this type of like regenerate, like regeneration of memories? I mean, I guess you referenced butterflies and some other things. Have we seen anything in like mammals, anything like, like that's more similar to us? Yeah. Um, the, 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 frog, so, so I'm not sure which frog brain experiment you're talking about. We'll have to, we'll have to maybe talk about that separately, but, but as far as mammals, okay. so, so there was a guy in the seventies and eighties, uh, there was a guy named George Ungar, um, who basically did a lot of the uh, memory transfer experiments in rats. And he had a ton of data that, uh, it, that, that, that work somehow died out. Not too many people are, are doing it. Um, it's obviously very hard to do those kinds of experiments in humans. Um, the one thing that the only kind of thing that I can point to, and, and, and I have to be clear, the data on this is extremely sparse. So I am not claiming that this is a fact. Uh, this is just something that has been reported and probably needs to be investigated to see if it's, uh, to see what the validity of it is. I don't know, but I do think it's interesting. Uh, people who study uh, recipients of heart and lung transplants uh, have, have published a number of cases where the recipient seemed to have acquired personality traits that were known to be present in the donor. So I don't know that this is true. These might be coincidences. Uh, there hasn't been a, a large enough study to really do this properly. But if that kind of thing turns out to be true, that would be an example in mammals of moving cognitive traits via tissue that is not brain tissue. So, mm. you know, we don't know. It's an open question. Maybe this is, maybe, maybe it's real and maybe it's not, but, but that, that, that's where you would start to look for things like this, given, given that you can't do functional experiments in humans. Yeah. I wonder if when we have the ability to regenerate a portion of damaged brain, if, mm. if the, if the memories or the function of that region is stored elsewhere, if it'll like kind of like flood back in, yeah. um, and, you know, re repair, uh, those type of pathways as well. Yeah. But, um, well, it's, it's the, a good, it's a good question because everybody's interested in developing, um, Re regenerative therapies for for brain degeneration and uh, aging and things like that and so so if we imagine in the future putting either stem cells or somehow inducing the patient's uh, brain to grow new tissue what's going to happen to the patient right are their personal is their personal identity going to remain the same are they going to roll back to you know some sort of um uh, a baby like state i i, I suspect not i suspect that uh, from from everything that we see uh, cells are very good at, and tissues are very good at instructing each other about uh, with this kind of information, but we don't know. So that, that remains, uh, an important thing for the future. And there was, a. it was related to some work with, that you were doing with frogs where you like cut, cut their limb and then you were working with a bioreactor to kind of slowly grow out their limb back. And, but the, you were looking at voltage, uh, you're looking at the cells uh with a voltage sense of dye and i was wondering when you when you cut like when you look at axolotls frogs or let's well, just look at axolotls and frogs or even planary i guess you maybe you could have done this as well when you so with planary and axolotls when you with planaria when you cut it they can grow from both pieces to something new like they can regrow themselves so i'm wondering uh for for things that can re regrow like planaria or axolotls or induced regeneration in frogs when you look at the the voltage of the areas when they're cut for like the planaria when when you have the two pieces to the are the voltages is the same when they start regrowing themselves and compared to the axolotl or the frog where the limb is severed and then the like if my hand was severed would the voltage be different than the limb that's still attached to my body and i'm, I'm just kind of wondering what's the difference that from a voltage level that allows uh planaria to naturally start regrowing from both sides of the limb like the, both sides of the severine versus like a frog that you can induce to regrow its limb and the axolotl that just regrows from its main body to its limb as well versus like the limb regrowing its body. I'm curious if there's something there that you've noticed with the, the voltage gradients as you 
have made Severain on on both sides. That, that might be like a really comp, uh, weird, like convoluted way to just to ask this question. So feel free to like ask for clarification if I did a poor job. Yeah. No, I understand. It's a, it's actually an excellent question. Uh, and and the, what I what I hear is the question of uh, if we if we cut off an appendage and the main body regrows that appendage, how come the appendage isn't regrowing the rest of the body? That's what the, that's, mm -hmm. that's that's what I heard. So that's actually a really interesting point. Um, we played around with this a little bit in the tadpole tail. So what happens is if you take a tadpole and you cut off uh, the last third of its tail, the tadpole will regrow the rest of the tail. Now the question is, what does the tail tip do? Why why does that not regrow mm -hmm. anything? Um, the answer is, uh, if you if you watch the bioelectric state, it actually does try. It has it has basically the same bioelectric state on at the wound site as does the tadpole, which tries to get it to regenerate. In fact, it even grows a little bit. Uh, it grows some tissue on the mm -hmm. other end. It does not complete. It certainly doesn't grow the whole tadpole. Um, now the real question is why there's a there's a, there's a potentially a boring answer and there's potentially a more interesting answer. The boring answer might be, well, it doesn't have a food supply. It doesn't have a blood flow. It doesn't have you know how are you going to grow a whole new tadpole if you don't have uh, the ability to replenish your metabolic needs? There's no blood pumping. So so that would that that hypothesis would suggest that if you were to take one of these pieces and somehow connect it to a nutrient supply and oxygenation and everything that that it would in fact then survive long enough to make to make a whole tadpole that's that's one possibility of course we've never done that it's very hard to do so no no one's done that the other possibility kind of the more interesting possibility is that the reason it doesn't is because it doesn't have the right information it doesn't know how so that would argue that the information is either stored somewhere upstream in the rest of the body so that the appendage by itself just doesn't know what to do or that it's simply a um, like a, um, a critical mass effect that basically there's just not enough cells. You need a certain amount of, you, you need a certain number of cells to know what to do. So, so holograms are kind of this way, right? If you have a, if you have a piece of holographic film that, um, it has some kind of pattern on it, you can cut that film into pieces and you can go smaller and smaller and you still get the whole pattern. It's just that it, it, every smaller piece, it's fuzzy. It gets fuzzier and fuzzier. And eventually you get to a piece that's small enough that there's just not enough information there to know what you're looking at. And for planaria, this is true too. You can cut planaria into hundreds of pieces, but once you get small enough, they don't really regenerate anymore. And, and, and again, one possibility is that there's just not enough cells in that network to, to keep the memory of what to do. So I don't know which of those things is true. Uh, we, right now, the technology isn't such that we could uh, tell that apart, but, um, but it's entirely, but, 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 the but the pieces do try to grow something. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it might, my my guess would be, and what do I know? But it would be like some combination of the two because if it has all the information, it still needs food. So I like it still would find, need a way to like. I think of like with cellular agriculture where they take cells and they have to have like a nutrient bath, yeah. and then they have to do a lot of work to make like a beef related like a beef similar thing. Um, so I imagine it's like some type of like uh, spectrum where it's like it's a little bit of both. But well, I, I guess in the future, hopefully, we'll know. Um, you've taken. Well, there's another thing with planaria, and then I think we'll probably go to uh, mammals. But the uh, you you uh, were able to induce anatomy that from previously ex like extinct or previous. I don't know. I think of like previous versions of planaria. Like they it would have like a round head. They made it like a triangle head from like one one of their past generations. And uh, George Church is working on taking uh, DNA and, and uh, transposing it into uh, Asian elephants, I believe. And then to recreate uh, features, well, functionality of a bully mammoth to like do stuff in the taiga and stuff like that. Could could you could you do the thing with planaria to Asian elephants? That's the closest relative that we have to bully mammoths to like to like work its way back that way to uh, recreate that those anatomical features. Or is the or is that possible? Is that like something you can do, or is it more like, uh, or did I miss like how you actually did it? Because it seemed like you were able to. You know, like the heads and making them triangle and stuff like you were able to grab it from like a previous like iteration of the species yeah so so let me let me first uh just describe what what we actually did and then we could talk about uh the applications to uh, uh to to resurrecting species um what we did was <clears throat> we uh we took a planarian with a triangular a species of planarian with a triangular head we amputated mm. the head 
and we let them regenerate in the solution of a chemical that blocks electrical communication between cells. In the absence of that, elect it's basically general anesthetic. That's what general anesthetics do. They decouple, oh, yeah. informationally decouple the cells. <clears throat> when the network, um, when the network is is decoupled, it uh, it has a it has a hard time uh, maintaining memory, and so when you pull the drug out, the electrical patterns settle down, but they don't always settle down in the correct pattern. Sometimes they settle down in another attractor of the state space of that circuit. And these other attractors, what these attractors do is they, is they instruct cells how to build the, how to rebuild the next structure. And so if you land in the wrong attractor, it'll build heads of different shapes. So instead of the triangular head, you might get a round head or a flat head or some other head shapes. Um, now these other head shapes, typically belong to a completely different species of planarian. And these are not extinct. Oh, I mean, they could be, but they're not. They, they happen not to be extinct. Uh, it, it, but 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 those exact same cells with the exact same genome is able to recapitulate the morphogenetic uh, uh, instructions of a completely different species. So that's so that's that's what we've seen. Uh, is that going, you know, is that going to work in mammals? Could you use that? I mean, I, I, yes and no. I think I think there are two things. Um, it is certainly, I think, true that mammalian cells are able to build way more than what they normally build by default. I think they're no different from every kind of cell, and we've shown this. We haven't shown this much in mammals yet, uh, but we've shown this in other creatures, and the mammalian work is going to be published, I think, in a couple of months, but I can't talk about it yet. But 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 basically, um, all cells have the ability to explore this 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 enormous latent space of anatomical structures around the structure that it normally builds, with with the same genetics. So 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 what evolution gives us via the genetics is a uh, a, a machine that uh, a physiological machine that is able to traverse morphospace, anatomical morphospace, the same way that uh, vehicles and robots and, and animals are using a phys the physiology of neurons to traverse three-dimensional space. And so they could, they could end up in different regions of that space. If they make different decisions, they'll end up in different regions of that space and they'll make different things. So there is a huge plasticity and some of those shapes will be completely novel. Some of those shapes will look like uh, creatures that we've seen before that may or may not be extinct. Some of them will look like um, creatures okay. that, uh, that uh, we, we, you know, we've never seen. Well, there's there's going to be a, there's a huge variety. So, okay. so that that I think is true. Now, whether whether uh, how how much plasticity? So, could you use that to um, move a particular species into another one that you wanted? Could you go from elephant to mammoth or something like that? We don't know. We don't know what the limitations of plasticity are in mammals. And my my gut feeling is that there are few limitations. I think if we knew what we were doing, we would make almost anything. That's that's a, but that's my own. Uh, kind of uh, conjecture that we don't know that yet. Um, and I also would make the conjecture that doing it uh, top down via some sort of um, informational control mediated by bioelectrics or something like that is probably going to be a much easier way of doing it than bottom up with uh, the genetics. That's just that's that's my opinion. But um, again, we we don't know that remains to be that remains to be seen. Yeah, the the biomanuf biomanufacturing. Uh as a, as a branch to go down, um, I, I think we, uh, George Rich and I was, were nerding about this in our last interview as well, but, uh, this idea that we could, instead of manufacturing like this, this pen or this, you know, anything that we're using today, uh, people made it or a factory made it to create a, a biological, like to co-opt a biological system to then create it, uh, bi biologically by itself. So instead of, I, th I think you make a, a good point in either one of your talks or one of your papers where if you're if you're trying to re, if you're trying to grow a hand to like attach onto someone or like an organ you have to like know so many different aspects of it but if you could if you could do the hand to like regrow it it's like it's like more like top down like we're, we're talking about i think that's more of a simpler way to think about it like instead of bottom up you can go top down which is uh uh simpler because you don't have to uh regulate all this stuff like kind of regulates itself and so I, I, i've been generally wondering like how could we get to a point where our world is Biomanufacturer, bio we biomanufacture the things around us. And there's uh, the I don't know if you're a fan of the Expand series, but there's like a proto, proto molecule that kind of does that, where like expands out and starts like building stuff with biology. But um, to, to to what extent do you think uh, we could do something like that, where we could move systems 
that are traditionally uh, made manufacturing to something that's derived from biology. Maybe we, it's kind of like the the Star Trek. It reminds me of like kind of the Star Trek like synthesizer that you tell it what you want and it comes out. Yeah. But maybe for limited things like uh, it's like a I don't know like a a womb esque thing that we've co opted to make rice of a certain quality that then like generates or something. I don't know how you do it, but like, what do you think about biomanufacturing in that way? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that, uh, that we think about a lot as the goal of our field is uh, something we call a, uh, an anatomical compiler. So the idea mm -hmm. is that someday you should be able to sit down in front of a computer and describe the animal plant or plant that you want in, uh, uh, in anatomical detail, and it can be something that exists. It can be something completely crazy that uh, has never existed. It shouldn't matter. And if we knew what we were doing, we could, uh, we could, uh, the, the, the system would, uh, output a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells to, um, get them to build whatever it is that we wanted. That's, that's the goal. Ultimate control of growth and form of shape by being able to, communicate to the collective intelligence of cells what they should be building. That's the, that's the trick. And so the idea is that this is not, this is not some sort of 3D printer that uh, I'm talking about. Um, this, is, uh, this is a communications device. Uh, this is something that um, allows, allows us to communicate our goals to the uh, represented goals of the collective intelligence of, of a swarm of cells to get them to build it. Now, I, I think it's coming. I think we're going to have that at some point. I think that um, it's, uh, it's essential if we're going to develop uh, the, the, the regenerative therapies that we want. I don't think we're going to get most of that bottom up. I think that's going to have to be top down. And the biggest, the biggest barrier to all of that is uh, the kind of, um, um, kind of a, a really prevalent, what I call a teleophobia. It's this, uh, it's, 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 uh, the generic desire of scientists to look at things in the uh, in the lowest level possible. So, so they would rather they would look at a new system, some kind of chemical system or physical system or or engineered system, and the preference is that to figure out some way of thinking about this that is the least uses the least amount of um, cognitive kinds of um, uh, descriptors. So, so, so they would rather have a system, an explanation from the point of view of physics and chemistry than one from the, from some sort of agential point of view where you're talking about its memories, its goals, its preferences and things like that. So, so the problem, and, and so in many, so, so that's the, the, the problem there is that a lot of people treat that as a, as a, as a philosophical truth. They sort of think that you can sit back and have, um, a priori kind of feelings about certain systems and whether or not they're agential. And, and people will often say, they look at something and go, well, that's just chemistry and physics. That doesn't have true goals or that's not really memory or, you know, whatever. Um, the thing is that um, that, that kind of view leaves a lot on the table because it's just as easy to make, uh, to make mistakes in the direction of ascribing too much cognition to something. And that's what they're, that, that's what, that's what scientists, that's, that's what started this whole, this whole slide, because, because back in the day, you know, in the pre-scientific times, when, when people sort of saw minds everywhere in nature, all around them and, and, and the scientists said, okay, look, let's, let's try to, let's try to uh, uh, use Occam's razor and pare all this stuff down to, to a, a more mechanistic understanding of what's going on. And that's, and that's great. But um, there's just as many ways to over-ascribe uh, mind as there are to under ascribe mind. And when you treat a system that has cognitive capacities as if it were a mechanical clockwork, you lose a lot. And so, so the framework that I've been working with is this, is this idea is called TAME, T-A-M-E, technological approach to mind everywhere. And the idea is that there is a spectrum of cognition and that no matter what you're looking at, whether it's evolved, designed, whether it looks biological or it doesn't, or, or how it got here, you have to actually do experiments. You can't just have feelings about um, what level of cognition it has. And if you get it right, the, the benefits of getting it right are, as you, were, as you were pointing out, much more efficient prediction and control. If you, if you can, you know, the reason, the reason that, that when you, on your computer, go, you want to go from Microsoft Word to Photoshop, you don't get out your soldering iron and start soldering away, right? You, you could, and that's how we did it in the 50s. That's how you would, you would do it that way. But, but we don't do that anymore because there's a much better top-down way of doing it. The same thing, uh, if you wanted a rat to do a circus trick, you don't have to go and try to play every neuron as a puppet. I mean, in theory, you could, but it would take a really long time and be really hard. Or you can just train the rat. And what you're doing there is, and people were training um, dogs and horses and things like that, 
for a millennia before they knew any neuroscience. Because you don't have to sweat all the internal details if you understand the level of cognition that the system has and you're, you have an interface for communicating with it. And so uh, I think the future of this um, uh, anatomical compiler is to take advantage of the interfaces that we have for communicating with cells and tissues. And my, my favorite interface is bioelectrical, but other people have biochemical and biomechanical interfaces. And if we can uh, coordinate with the, with, the, with the baked in intelligence of the system, with the problem solving capacities of that system, we will be much better off than if we assume it's a mechanical clockwork and, there, and then everything's up to us to micromanage. That's, a, that's a, I think, a losing proposition. So I, think, so I think the future of this field is, and I think AI is going to really help with that because people are going to really get used to this idea that you cannot just tell how smart something is based on your expectations. You have to, you, 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 you sometimes get surprised. And we've, we've, We've published a number of systems where uh, uh, where we found some amazing surprises in, in in the cognitive capacities of systems that don't look like they should have some, and then you can take advantage of it. That's 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 huge. Do you, if if uh, going down that line, the making the anatomical compiler, would we do you see as we're making the steps to the point where it's like uh, complete? Like if you imagine, like you know, fifty years in the future, you have everything that you want. Uh, the steps to get there. Do you see it as uh, co-opting an already domesticated organism to uh, utilize for an anatomical compiler? So like utilizing yeast or E. coli that's already been pretty domesticated, or is it like you, the more effective line would be to make an anatomical compiler that could do it to like any cell, any uh, organism that you want. So would you co-opt existing things that have been developed out uh, and then keep going forward? Or would that be kind of like a quagmire that would get you down a different route that would um, take you away from the, the future that you see? Like, which one do you think would get you there quicker, if you, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think um, I think the only reason to um, kind of adopt uh, what you call domesticated cells is that what you would be dealing with is cells whose uh, whose capacities you would understand better. So, so I think I think the early versions of that technology are going to be really good for cells and tissues where we really understand what their capabilities are, and those will be, of course, the domesticated ones. Down the line, if somebody brings you a weird cell, a weird new cell that you have no idea what this thing is capable of, there will be some ways to study it and then and then use that in the compiler. Ultimately, I think it'll be any cell that can be used. But the early mm. applications will be the ones where you really know, you know, and and some of it is is tricky, right? So 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 horses are easy to train, zebras are not. And you might think that, well, why, you know, we could just, you know, we could just do the same thing to zebras. It actually doesn't work. People have tried for a long time. It doesn't work. And there are reasons why it doesn't work. So, so understanding the, the um, capabilities and the psychology of your, uh, of your um, substrate of the material. And this is, you know, we call it an agential material is we call cells an agential material, understanding its capabilities will determine how well it's going to work in the compiler for you. Uh, just a quick on the horses, the, the, I think is is isn't the reason that zebras don't work is that they don't have a group structure to manipulate. Like horses have a hierarchical group structure, so we can kind of like insert ourselves as the dominant one and then domesticate them down. Where zebras are kind of like lone wolves a little bit that happen to be in groups. So what's the reason? Why, like, I don't know if, if you know this answer, but uh, I'll, I might have to Google this. But why why uh, if it is a quick answer, why do horses work and zebras not? Like, is there like one reason that we've been able to tie it to the two? Because I think. I grew up on a farm and I think I remember having this conversation with a, a farmer who tried this and they made the um, the uh, idea that it was basically because uh, zebras don't have the t same type of group structures that domesticated animals do like the in terms of hierarchies. So like cows, uh, every, every single animal that we domesticated is usually like we come in and just like take over as the top of the organization and then they kind of follow us around for where I don't think zebras do that. But yeah. yeah, do you know why that is? So yeah, I'm 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 no expert on on zebras. I I, <laughs> yeah. I've, I read the same thing that you've read, which is that they're just not built to uh, uh they, they don't they don't have a, an innate expectation of a of a of a group a leader kind of a kind of a scenario. Now, um, more broadly, I think all that's telling us is that we have to learn to work with a very wide variety of yeah. uh, of diverse intelligences and diverse cognitive structures. And uh, and and deal with with them at the appropriate level and with using the appropriate um, currency 
for every system, right? What do they want? What do they like? What do they dislike? That kind of thing. Yeah. So do you, um, uh, to quote the, uh, to quote Westworld, uh, Ford, I don't know if you watch the show, it's pretty good. The first couple seasons are good, at least. The last uh, few are sad and terrible. But do you think using bioelectricity as a framework that we would be able to call Lazarus from his cave in terms of being able to resurrect people? If if we understood how electricity works and in, in people's bioelectricity works in people's body, do you think we could resurrect people that are dead? Well, a um, couple of things. Uh, first of all, amazingly enough, uh, the one ex- the one very popular existing bioelectrical therapy does exactly that, and that's the that's the mm-hmm. um, cardiac resuscitation device. Is the the right? So so we now have a bioelectrical technology to bring back people that in the olden days would have been considered dead. So somebody's heart stops. Uh, in the olden days, you would have said, okay, that person is is dead. And now we have a bioelectrical device that get, literally brings them back, right? So, so, so uh, you know, one of these um, resuscitation devices. So, so, so that already exists. Now, now the next question. So we, so we know the answer to that is yes. Now, now the next question is, well, how far dead? And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, and, and people are working on this, by the way. There, are, there are there are people who are working on this at the at the body level. I was in a I was in a symposium recently where um, it was on the nature of life and death, and and somebody was talking about uh, being able. To, well, he he first he went he went to uh, he went to a supermarket and he got some um, some packaged uh, uh, cold chicken, and he was able to pull out uh, living stem cells out of that and culture it. And then, if I remember correctly, he went down to the police uh, lockup and he and he was t- able to take some samples from bodies that were in the fridge for like a month, and basically get living stem cells out of that and culture those. Now, hmm. that's not the same thing as getting the person back. You're basically cloning the body, as it were, which you know w- w- that may have some applications and whatnot. You know, c- could could you bring back somebody that was gone for a significant a significant amount of time? I, I, I don't know. Um, there are many reasons to think the answer is no, because once the blood flow stops pretty quick, things in the brain start dying. And I'm not sure what, what bioelectricity would do at that point once your structure is completely broken down. But it's not crazy to think that with regenerative therapies, right, if we had a way to regenerate from brain damage, some degree of reconstruction from some amount of time that currently seems like it's impossible might become possible. I don't know. Hmm. So um, going, uh, continuing with the regeneration, there, there's, I have many friends in the brain computer interface space and I, I pose them this question all the time. So the, for people, I think it's always good to like give one person that people might know. So uh, Superman Christopher Reeves was, uh, uh, was paralyzed and he passed away a few years ago. So, uh, um, but he, the entire time he was alive, he kept funding research to um because he wanted to walk again and so i always wonder for people who are alive today who are paralyzed what approach is going to get them the ability to walk again and feel the sand and the the grass beneath their feet um is it going to be brain command interfaces that you know work you know basically uh to to bridge the damage or will it be a regenerative bioelectric bioelectric technique that um uh, induces the damage to repair itself so w- when it comes to the fidelity of being able to walk to walk in if Chris Reeves was alive today, which route do you think would give him and people like him the ability to, to achieve that uh, the quickest? Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think there, there are going to be a combination of, uh, of, of possibilities. Uh, there's going to be many different options eventually. Um, I think that on, on the one hand, uh, some sort of re- top-down regenerative therapy that gets you back the, the the a functional structure like you had before. In the short term, that's your best option for something that gives you the same experience as you had before. Uh, those things are just very very difficult to recapitulate with with engineered prosthetics. On the other hand, long term, big big picture thinking now. I I don't think that we're going to be locked into the standard human form for very long. I think eventually you will have the you will have what I call morphological freedom, right? Right. So right. So right now you're born and you have behavioral freedom to some extent. You can you can do various things in three dimensional space, but you really have very limited morphological freedom. If you're born in a normal human, 
that's pretty good. And that's, that's how you're going to stay. If you're born with some sort of birth defect or missing limbs or whatever, uh, you know, that's where you stay. And so, so we have very limited morphological freedom. I think, I think in the future, that freedom is going to be huge. So, so in the end, uh, ultimately, if you're, if you decide that you want to be in some robotic body with, uh, with various new, uh, new kinds of uh, appendages and whatnot, it's not going to be an issue of, can I get back the function of the two feet that I was born with and that everybody else is born with? The issue is going to be, what kind of body do I want? That's a combination of biologicals, uh, um, engineering, whatever. What do I want? Do I want tentacles, wings, uh, some extra eyes? Well, what, what, what do I, where am I going to live? Am I going to live on earth? Am I going to live somewhere else? And what, what, and, and what my, what should my body be? That the, 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 the bigger picture is going to be some sort of a, um, uh, an incredibly large option space of uh, hybrid living robotics that we, where you will, you know, that, that your body will be whatever, whatever you want it to be. So I think that's kind of, that's, that's the, that's the long-term view. There's a book series called the inheritance cycle uh, by Christopher Polini. And the elves in that series could remake their body with magic. So they would be like all these different forms and stuff or, and even like have some of the characteristics of the animals as well. Like they just liked completely, I don't know, like a uh, LARPing as different animals as well. I don't, I don't know if the anatomy necessarily encouraged a certain behavior, but the, there's some really interesting uh, science fiction or, or, or fiction that, you know, talks about uh, doing similar things. And um, there's one called the, uh, I think it's a Hamilton, Hamilton Com, or no, the Hamilton Commonwealth series, where the way that they achieved immortality was basically every couple of years, they would just regenerate their bodies back to like the, the desired set and they could do what you're talking about, like they could change all their limbs. So I, I do love this idea that you know, eventually we can get there. And then I, I you know, science fiction just, and, and like we didn't have cell phones before Star Trek, like Star Trek kind of inspired us. So I, I, I think a lot of stuff is really inspiring to see where we can go if we just dream in our bold. And let, you know, smart people like yourself or other people who are listening are like, oh, this sounds really cool. Because my pretty much my entire life, I've, I've kind of imagined a system like what you're doing with the mice where you have like a bioreactor on a hand and let induce it to do that, to to go out. Like that made more sense than going, you know, ground level up. Um, so it's really cool to, but that's mainly from science fiction. Like you know, I wasn't like doing what you're doing your entire life. So I, I love that people can get really excited about this stuff and, and hopefully support it. Is there anything in, either in your lab or your companies that you need for the anatomical compiler, bioreactor? Is there any known unknowns that either people listen in or just in general that you know you need to tackle in the upcoming years to achieve your vision um, for the immediate goals that you have of like regrowing a limb and stuff like that? The the complete reshaping of our anatomical space seems like something that would be like, you know, maybe like 50 to 100 years in the future. So um, what do you need to achieve your objectives in the next like five-ish years? Is there anything, are there any known unknowns that either people can help with or that you're working and chewing through right now. When you say people, do you mean the general public or do you mean other scientists or do you mean investors or what, what kind of people are we talking about? Uh, scientists, people listening in, and there's also investors who like they're, they're, they're people who do that as well. Yeah. I listener. mean, yeah. So, so th there are, there are many known unknowns. Uh, this is a, uh, a very a kind of vibrant research program with lots of questions that need to be answered. Um, Basically, the only thing we need right now is uh, is more work, uh, more people, mm -hmm. uh, is, is scientists in labs like mine doing the actual work to answer these questions. That requires resources and funding. This is very expensive work. That, that's that's about it. Uh, there isn't any magic step here. There isn't uh, you know kind of um, uh, anything that uh, isn't going to be addressed by the right number of people working in interdisciplinary areas. So we need people with expertise in computer science, in, in engineering and cognitive science and behavioral science is all very important. It's not just biochemistry and genetics. Uh, so, a, so a really interdisciplinary uh, set of attacks on this major problem of what do collectives of cells know? What measurements do they take? How do they make decisions? Um, yeah, these are all, you know, this is all a, a research program. It needs more experience. It needs more people doing experiments. That's what it means. Uh, is that something you can uh, achieve within your lab or do you need to have an external structure like a SENS or something to gather um, interest, money, et cetera, to support several science labs at the same time? So could you could you build it under your umbrella or do you need an external nonprofit or a DAO of some kind to uh, bring the public in to help you? Um, I, 
Well, there's two questions here. One, one, one is, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly don't believe that I'm going to do all this by myself. So for sure, m there are many other labs besides my lab that are working on related useful areas. So we collaborate with hundreds of other people doing, doing these things. Um, and, uh, and so, so my, my claim is not that, the, that the, my, my lab has any kind of a monopoly on this stuff. So, so lots of people are doing useful, useful things in this field. So that's, that's for sure. Um, as far as, you know, I, I, I vaguely know what DAOs are. I have no idea what the right, uh, you know, funding structure for any of this is other than the idea that, um, this, by this research is very expensive. Uh, I, I don't know that the average person has any ability to, to impact this because, you know, we're talking about get, getting, get, just to give you a ballpark, get, getting anything really accomplished is in the scale of um, uh, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, more likely multiple millions of dollars, right? Get any, anything, never mind finishing it, but, but getting any discrete useful step forward is, is an expensive proposition. So the ecosystem is is pretty diverse now. So there are, of course, so there's some government funding, which is which is very tight. It's always very tight. Uh, there are some investors. Investors like it when you're close to a product, which uh, you know some things are and some things are not. It's a very basic science. There are nonprofit um, uh, foundations. There are lots of disease foundations, and all of us scientists are spending a, a significant amount of our time trying to cobble together these various sources. To get enough money to keep the research going, it's it's a, it's a it's a big break on progress. Actually, it's it, it wastes a lot of time. But I mean, I, I don't I don't have a better uh, I don't have a better suggestion for for how to do it other than um, yeah, this is you know whatever whatever structures are going to are going to support the work in the um in the field. That's uh, that's that's what we need. Yeah, I was uh, last week. Uh, Lisa from Sands's episode went live, and she talked about how on average for the different routes that they're going down for longevity, that it's like one to 5 million, like the Mito Sense project has been like $5 million to get that. And it's it's starting to bunt off into a translational uh, technology, but I mean, it, it takes a, a bit of money, but it does sound like for biomanufacturing, for bioelectricity, it does, there's not like a, um, a group that's come together to like help uh, build out the industry, like longevity with Sense and uh, Leaf and stuff like that. Uh, well, I mean, so, so there are there are groups that have come together. So, uh, you know, we 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 have we have. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't think I can go into details, but but we have some funding from a group that's pulling together a variety of of different uh, different investors that are trying to move this forward. So there, there are there are some groups, but um, mm -hmm. you know, again, I don't I, I don't know if 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 breadth is the thing that's needed here, or or you know, a combination of uh, specific. Um, individuals who have who have resources to move things forward I, I have no idea I, you know I don't have any expertise on the on the funding side I've been I've been sort of for the last 25 years just sort of cobbling it together from different sources from every kind of uh, every kind of potential um, source you can imagine so yeah makes sense so uh, transitioning to longevity and it's uh, probably our last big temple po topic we get to talk about today the if you think about high versus low engineering like Yamanaka versus bioelectric subroutines for longevity and house band, which 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 route do you think will achieve longevity to the level that people think about it? Like how uh, Albert Gray, um, I don't like give people like ten more years, twenty more years, thirty more years. Which which route do you think has the best potential in the next, let's say, like ten years to uh, affect people's health span or our larger horizon if it just takes more time to develop like the higher level uh, um, regeneration? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'll preface this by saying that I, 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 uh, I do not, uh, I don't have any uh, uh, specific work in longevity yet. So, so I don't have mm -hmm. any specific uh, axe to grind on any kind of um, longevity application to, directly. But I do think that big picture, um, big picture, it's uh, to me, it seems uh, almost guaranteed that. Uh, Properly solving regeneration is the is the cure for aging. I think that um, re what you really want is to be continuously replenishing the body and rejuvenating it, uh, not trying to deal with it uh, with a sinking ship at the end with with some sort of you know bottom up heroics. I think that I think that uh, we really need to understand how the body comes to be in the first place, and then we can help that pattern maintain during uh during during life i think it's going to be something like that i mean planaria are telling us that it's possible right planaria are immortal 
they don't they don't age they're the one of the most maybe the most regenerative system out there i don't think that's an accident they're cancer resistant they're um they're uh they're profoundly regenerative and uh and they have an incredibly messy genome which is all which also tells you something interesting about the role of uh the role of genetics in this process so 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 long term you know there there may be there may be short term gains as far as um things to prevent uh, oxidative damage and things like that but i think i think long term the the way to do this is to perfect the algorithm of self repair not not just focus on the hardware hmm. uh just um jumping off of the immortal concept it reminded me that i wanted to ask you this question the so some, some i think sometimes i don't know if it's all the time i don't know enough to say all the time but a lot of times the when cancer is in the body it when it like separates and becomes its own little thing uh they they're they're essentially immortal and they'll just keep living so i was wondering why would some why would a mortal cell generate an immortal cell and then I think you've done research, or I was talking to Michael Forrest, who might have been doing research. I don't remember where I'm getting this uh, the citation from, unfortunately. The, uh, but there's like a there's a there's an electrical gradient difference between the like the, the cancer and the cells around it. Like, oh yeah, okay, you did do the research on this because uh, you uh, you induced uh, you gave I think it was a frog with some type of animal uh, a cancer on its back, and then you uh, then gave an intervention to like tell the cells around it like look kind of like. Uh, I don't remember what you told it to do, but it, like it took care of the cancer. Yeah. So then, yeah. But the the quite the the higher level question is like, how can mortal make a mortal, it, when they they come from the same uh thing? Like, what how how why would that happen? Yeah, let's let's take a step back uh, and and really think about what what the nature of of cancer is. Um, the re the, the the real question isn't well, how do we get cancer the real question is why isn't it all cancer all the time 100 percent of the time we we mm -hmm. we are we are all uh, uh the descendants of cells that were immortal amoebas yeah we we, we all used to be single cell organisms which are immortal amoeba and amoeba will just keep dividing indefinitely right and then eventually these kind of um unicellular organisms uh started to merge together and make this kind of um, this kind of a multicellular structure that we call our bodies. And so the real question isn't how do you make immortal cells that that's what we are to begin with. The question is mm. uh, how do you s prevent some of those cells from dividing out of control and working towards a specific complex shape. So the thing about the vast majority, I mean our eggs are immortal, but the vast majority of our body cells in fact, are harnessed not towards making copies of themselves. They're harnessed towards making a specifically a specific complex anatomical structure. So, um, so that so that's the question. Now, now once you pose it that way, and you understand that there are mechanisms for suppressing uh, cells' native uh, uh, um, uh, goal structure of, of making copies of themselves, now 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 it becomes inevitable. As sometimes there's a failure mode of those mechanisms, right? Sometimes they go wrong. So uh, that's and that's the process that we call cancer. Though okay, cancer is a uh, is a is a failure of multicellularity, and what happens there is that uh, occasionally a a cell or a group of cells will informationally detach from the rest of the organism. They basically roll back to their unicellular roots. Uh, the boundary mm -hmm. between self and world shrinks. They're not more selfish than your other body cells. It's just that their cells mm -hmm. are smaller, right? The rest of the cells are working towards the goals of a giant self. Uh, these, these cells are working towards single cell, tiny little single cell goals, which basically just treat the rest of the body as external environment, right? So that, that boundary between self and outside has, has, sh has shrunk. Now, uh, so, so, so thinking about it that way, we said, well, what are the mechanisms that normally keep cells harnessed towards these larger structures? Well, that's the bioelectrical network that they're part of. That's what stores the pattern memories that enable them to make embryo body structures and so on. So, so we started looking for um, uh, bioelectric signatures of, of, of uh, cells uh, defecting from the network. And we found it, we could see using a voltage sensitive dye, you can actually see when the cells uh, are becoming disconnected. And, uh, and then we said, okay, well, what if we artificially reconnect them? And so we did that in the frog, and we're now in doing experiments in human glioblastoma cells, where you can, despite all the mutations and the oncogenes and everything else that might be in there, you force those cells to be in physiological connection with their neighbors. They kind of lose their identity a little bit. They become part of the collective, and the collective has large-scale goals, like making nice organs. 
instead of the, the tiny goals of single cells. And so that's, that's a different uh, approach to cancer therapeutics where you're not necessarily trying to kill off those cells. You're trying to get them to rejoin the, the collective. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So they, um, they don't gain a new behavior. They just default back to the previous behavior when they were uh, single cellular organisms. That's okay. That's an interesting way to look at it. The, um, I'm trying to like fit all my questions into our remaining time, but, uh, okay. So at Lex Freeman's podcast, you gave advice to people who were in college or, you know, about to leave college. And so, uh, I was wondering what advice would you give to people who are in their twenties, they found the career or they're in their thirties and they're thinking, I'm not happy with where I'm at to, um, what advice would you give to people who are not in college, who are more like they've taken the first steps or they're like, they're more into where they are in life and either they're thinking like, Hey, maybe there's something else out there for me or, um, to make the best use of whatever they're building. I think that probably comes down. I'm uh, no, never mind. I won't guess what your answer is. So what, what, what advice would you give to people like that, that are in their uh, mid mid twenties, mid thirties out of college. And, uh, you know, for people listening, you can listen at Lex Friedman's and get the, if you're in college and you can like pair it with us when you're at that stage too. Um, my advice would be, and it's, it's funny, a lot of people ask me this and it's kind of, it's kind of weird for me to uh, give advice on this because I don't know what anybody should do, but, but, the, but, the, but the advice that, uh, the advice that I do give is this work, work it backwards. Think, think about, it. I know it's hard when you're young, it's hard to visualize, but believe me, it sneaks up on your really quick uh, age does. And, uh, just, just visualize yourself as a, as an old person having lived a life and ask yourself, uh, what is it that I wish I would have done? In other words, what's the success criterion? What's the, what's the thing that at the end of your life, you look back and you go, wow, that's as well as that could have possibly gone. I am, I am satisfied with that. Like they're, they're, that was exactly it. So just visualize, what would that be? What would it be that where you said, yep, that's, uh, that's what I should have spent my life doing that. That's, that, that was a good bargain. Uh, what would that be? And whatever that is, work backwards to ask yourself, well, how do I get there? So, so that's, I, think, I think that's what you need because, because it's very easy in life to... Um, end up uh, with a very short horizon as far as what your goals are and what you're doing, but you got to have that long-term vision so that all the blood, sweat, and tears that you're putting into things in the end are feeding your, um, they're feeding your life mission. And if you don't know what your life mission is, it's very difficult to make uh, local decisions uh, re here and now that are going to be uh, good for you later on. So I think you really have to work on, it's, it's a pyramid. I think, uh, What's the name of the guy? I forget who did it, but the, but the, there's, there's this notion of GTD. I think it's called get things done or something. And it's, it's basically, it's very mm -hmm. simple. It's just a pyramid. And and at each level of the pyramid is, is something that you revisit on a progressively finer time scale. So at the top of the pyramid is your life goal, your life mission. And that shouldn't change much throughout your life. Figure out what that is and work towards it. And then below that, you have, you know, sort of the major accomplishments you need and then the, 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 the strategy and the tactics and everything else you're going to do to make that happen. And those you can revisit on a, on a monthly or a yearly level. And then in between, you kind of have course corrections that are maybe five, 10 years. But at, up at the very top, driving all of this should be, should be your life mission. And uh, that's, uh, everybody needs to find that for themselves. And if it changes, it changes, that's fine. But at any moment in time, you need to know what you think that is. And for me, the way that, uh, I tell, you know, I, that I visualize how people can discover that is to work it backwards. Just, just visualize yourself as a, as a, as a really old person looking back and saying, wow, yeah, that was, that was great. I did exactly what, um, what I should have done with my life and then work it backwards from there. Do you remember the age when you slotted in and discovered your life goal? Probably seven, eight, something like that. Wow. I've, I've, I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've known what I wanted to do from, from the, from, from a very early stage. I had no idea. I had no idea if it was possible. I had no idea what that looked mm -hmm. like. I had, you know, I was, I was a kid, then I was a teenager. I had no idea what um, the actual structures are in society. I, I never, I, well, and then when I, when I got old enough to, to, to know what reality was a little more, I, then, then, then it didn't seem like that was possible anymore. And so, so what I figured is I would just sort of aim in that direction as, as hard as I could. And then whatever, when I get derailed, I'll go back to coding. I used to be a programmer, um, you know, and, uh, and I thought, okay, well, when I get kicked out of, of, of grad school, then I'll, uh, I'll go, I'll go back to coding. And that was kind of, you know, just, I, you know, I had a compass. I said, this is where I want to go. Didn't really seem like that was going to be possible, but I'm going to get as far as I can. And then whatever happens after that happens. 
if you think of yourself when you when you think of yourself mentally is there an age you feel that you're at like like when i don't know if i'm asking this question well but there's the age that you are physically but when you think of yourself mentally is there an age that when you think of like how old do i feel i am uh what age that would be for you yeah um yeah oddly i do kind of know what what you mean uh although i think it's an interesting question um mentally i feel i feel uh late 20s mentally because mm-hmm. i feel like that was about the age when i really caught on to uh kind of thinking about things the way that i think about them now um f- physically uh I, I wish i wish i felt the way <laughs> the way i did in my 20s so i definitely don't feel that way physically but but mentally that's that's how i feel yeah late late mm-hmm. late 20s you know maybe 30 maybe something like that yeah. what books would you recommend people check out as you can tell uh there's more going that way but and you have a bunch of books behind you so what what book what books have you currently read recently or that you just generally recommend people check out it doesn't have to be related to work it just be things that you you love to read that you'd love to have and i will read them that's the cool thing so that um i'll read literally everything you suggest yeah um so so i have a on my website i have a i have a list of suggested mm. books um so uh, mm. it's it's really hard to name just one i mean uh oh, you, you don't know, name a few well, the thing, the thing that, uh, the thing that just pops into into my mind is, uh, uh, it's a classic. It's called Girdle Escher Bach by Doug Hofstadter. So I recommend that oh. to everybody. That's really good. Um, but otherwise, it's really hard to pick one. And so just go to my go to my website to the inspirations page, and there's a list of books there. Yeah, I remember uh, I started that book in college, but then I some stuff happened, so I got sidetracked. And I remember uh reading that book with a thesaurus it was like i could understand what they're saying if i just would like google the word so okay i see what they're saying because some of the words were like you know uh they, they talk, in the midwest they call it like a five dollar word but these were like fifteen dollar words but uh what is there something you're currently struggling or working to learn on personally for yourself like is there, so it's learning with low podcast and i'm just generally i'm always very interested in learn what people are trying to learn outside of just their profession what what and it could be a related profession i suppose but what do you um what are you struggling to learn or wishing to learn more of? Um, yeah, I mean, well, kind of, kind of everything. My profession is everything, uh, really. Uh, but uh, the thing that the thing that I struggle with the most is uh, is math. So I'm not particularly good in math, and uh, some of the um, uh, some of the some of the mathematical concepts that are useful to, for for understanding machine learning and for uh, kind of really really the bridge between between the information sciences and physics. There's some there's some math there that would be would be really nice if I understood that. Um, so that's kind of yeah. That's is my... there a, a is there a name for that type of math that you're not good at? There are many like differential equations are... or something. No, like, is it's... it like calculus? You know, like is it like a, a no? Like, it's be, I, that's it's... how little I know about math. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's beyond that, and it's uh, it's you know I'm not gonna uh, sort of. Uh, try to try to try to parse it out but it's basically mm. um you know it's the kind of stu- it's the kind of stuff that's used in uh, i mean some of it is linear algebra but it's not really it's not even really linear algebra some mm. of it is used for 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 doing quantum theory type stuff some of it is used for um uh active inference and and those kinds of those kinds of things uh yeah i'm, I'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to th- run in about a minute Yes. Yeah, I realized that. So uh, thanks, everybody, for, for tuning in to Learn With All Show. Thank you, Michael, for being on the show. And I, I, uh, everything will be in the show notes. Uh, so thank you for being on the show, Michael. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was nice to talk to you. Thank you.